think Kurt did kind of set the scene talking about the rise of China. It is obviously very strongly economically uh, based. Uh, their very strong uh, three decades of economic growth has propelled them to their uh, current position where we can talk about them uh, as a rising power. The key themes I want to emphasize tonight are that China's economic rise is on track despite uh, the global financial and economic crisis. I think China was the first globally significant economy to come off the bottom. They're now in a very strong recovery. They're not growing quite as fast as they were two years ago, but relative to the rest of the world, their performance uh, has been quite uh, stellar. I think also China has the potential to come back to a, or converge back towards its long-term potential growth rate uh, in advance of most of the rest of the world, certainly in advance of the United States and other, uh, it, uh, other uh, high income uh, industrial economies. And then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about additional steps they need to take uh, on the reform front uh, to move ahead on their uh, agenda and to make sure that that resumption of growth is more in the nine to 10% range uh, where it has been for so long rather than at a lower pace that might uh, eventuate if they don't take those kinds of steps. But let me begin. I'm going to put up some very simple diagrams uh, demonstrating a few of the things that I'm uh, talking about. The first one, obviously, is to demonstrate the recovery is, uh, that is underway in China. China has begun to release uh, quarter over quarter growth, which is what I want you to focus on the pink line here, which shows really China bottomed out in terms of its economic growth. The slow point, the lowest quarter, was the fourth quarter of last year. They began to recover uh, in the first quarter, growing at about 4 to 5 percent. Uh, in the second quarter, growing at almost 15 percent, and about 9 percent quarter over quarter uh, in the third quarter of this year. So now we're in the fourth quarter. China is in the fourth quarter of a very strong recovery that's going to lead to at least 8% growth this year and possibly something uh, closer to 9% next year. Obviously, the United States has not yet begun a recovery. Some European countries have, have begun to recover a little bit, but this is far and away the strongest growth performance uh, of any country on the globe, and it's basically a response to the government's policies and some of the structural factors that uh, advantage China in the current uh, situation. I'm not going to talk a great deal about the, the government response because I think we've all read about the stimulus package, the monetary expansion, the infrastructure, and so forth. What I want to do is to talk a bit about uh, the criticisms that have been leveled at China's recovery program, their stimulus program, and say that I think that they have been uh, overblown, exaggerated, and I think China's strong growth basically is going to prove to be sustainable. So what I'd just like to do is run through some of these criticisms. Certainly one of them is that it's all government investment. This is a, you're throwing a lot of money at the problem, the government's investing a lot of money, but eventually government investment a program will have to taper off, and when that happens, uh, growth will slacken. And in the interim, China's growth, of course, according to the critics, has become uh, more imbalanced uh, because the investment rate has remained elevated. The reality is actually somewhat uh, more uh, promising than that. Consumption growth in China this year has been extremely strong. Indeed, this, this is a uh, diagram that shows the rate of growth of consumption in the first three months of this year in all emerging market economies that provide this kind of data. It's a fairly big sample, and as you can see, China's way over there on the left. Uh, growing at around 8 to 9 percent in terms of underlying consumption. The um, story is the same thing in the second quarter. China's uh, consumption, if anything, has picked up slightly, uh, far and away the strongest growth of consumption. This is in part based on some significant growth of incomes in China that has occurred, which is uh, a reflection of the strong recovery. But it's also based in part on an acceleration or pickup in household borrowing. In other words, people are spending more because their incomes are growing, and they're also borrowing uh, to finance uh, expenditures, both consumption expenditures and, I'll say a minute later, uh, some investment expenditures as well. If you look at this diagram, you see that the slope of the lines has increased substantially in 2009, which means the increase in borrowing by households is substantially greater this year than it was last year. And this really points out one of the most remarkable differences between China, let's say, and the United States or uh, the UK, Spain, Ireland, and so forth. And that is uh, 
China's households don't have very much debt. So the way I put it is that China's growth this year has had a substantial portion of it based on an acceleration of consumption, and we could say that China is a re-leveraging story. Households are taking on more debt uh, to expand their consumption, and what we've seen in the United States is exactly the opposite. The data just came out the other day, yesterday, I believe, in the Wall Street Journal, that credit outstanding to households has now been declining in the United States for nine consecutive months. And the decline in household consumption is dragging down our economic growth because consumption is a very large share of total uh, aggregate demand. China's the opposite situation. People are borrowing more to finance uh, additional expenditures, and that is contributing to the very strong economic growth. Now, you might think, why should they follow our example? We didn't turn out so well. But just to put it in perspective, this is where China and the United States and the United Kingdom were on kind of the eve of the financial crisis, how much debt people had uh, relative to their disposable income, which is just after-tax income. And as you can see, the United States up at around 130 percent, the UK up at around 150 percent, and Chinese households had relatively little debt, about about a third of their disposable income. So they are in a position for a, a period of time they can increase their borrowing in order to finance uh, more expenditures uh, and uh, contribute uh, to the growth of their uh, economy. In addition, uh, so the, the first criticism or the first counter to the criticism that China's recovery is all based on um, government investment is, well, there's a very substantial portion that's coming from consumption. In addition, there is a portion that is coming from private investment, not government investment. And private investment here, I'm talking about, about real estate, which is overwhelmingly private. And Chinese leaders uh, in 2007 came to the view that their property market was getting a little frothy, a little inflated. It might be approaching a bubble. And as you can see in this diagram, uh, in most of the months in 2007, and continuing in the early part of 2000, growth of investment in real estate was running 25, 30 uh, percent growth uh, in every month. Uh, and unlike Alan Greenspan, who said he couldn't identify a bubble uh, even if he saw it, and if he saw it and someone told him it was a bubble, he wouldn't know what to do about it, uh, and he'd rather clean up the mess afterwards and try to let the air out because that was too risky, uh, the Chinese put some brakes on real estate investment uh, at the uh, beginning at the tail end of 2007 and continuing through 2008. They raised the down payment requirements, they raised the interest rates a number of times, and took a number of other steps. And as you can see, it worked pretty well. Throughout 2008, you had a slowdown in real estate investment. Prices softened a little bit. The, the froth came out of the market. Uh, but then when the global crisis hit uh, and China decided they needed a little bit more aggregate demand, at the beginning, at the tail end of last year, just about a year ago, they reversed some of those steps, and they made it easier to get mortgage loans. They reduced the interest rates and so forth, and they've gradually built the real estate market uh, back up. Prices are beginning to rise, but it's not a bubble yet. On average, uh, in September, for example, house prices were about 3% higher than they had been in September of 2008. And you can see here we've had a recovery of the growth of real estate investment. It's now growing 15 20% per year. Um, month-by-month -month basis, but we're not up to the 25, 30 percent that we had back in 2007. So there has been a recovery of uh, private investment in housing, and that's the second example that shows that China's recovery is not all based on uh, government uh, investment. Now there's a third uh, dimension that I want to also point out <laughs> that also suggests that this government investment story that we read about in the press all the time has been somewhat um, exaggerated, and that is that the government expenditures that we've seen uh, this year and really starting a couple of years ago have had a very, very large place for uh, social expenditures, education, health, and pensions. This shows how much those expenditures have increased since 2003, and the, maybe the diagram's a little bit complicated, but basically the story here is that starting in 2006, we had a very substantial acceleration of the growth of government expenditures. This was, remember, the period in which they were eliminating school fees uh, in the countryside over a several year period. This is a period in which they're beginning to dramatically expand uh, 
the provision of health insurance, even in the, even in the countryside through a rural cooperative health care uh, scheme, um, and other kind of pensions, pension payments in China for those people who are currently retired, they were increased by 10% at the beginning of 2008, 10% at the beginning of 2009, and they will be increased an additional 10% uh, next, on January 1st, uh, 2010. So this is a very substantial increase, way, way, way in excess of inflation, uh, very substantial increase in pension payments. Just to give you a little bit more detail, if you just focus on health, Chinese government health expenditures in 2008 were two times what they were in 2006. There's no other country in the world that has doubled their health expenditure uh, in a two-year period. This reflects the dramatic expansion uh, in the health, care, uh, the health insurance programs um, that I've already mentioned. This, these consumption expenditures on the part of the government are very important because they, they are an, a, diversifying the sources of demand. It's not just investment. We also have some social programs. And they're also important because uh, the high savings rate in Chinese households is in part precautionary. People are uncertain about whether they'll get health care, whether they'll be able to afford to send their kids to school and so forth. If the government provides those programs uh, on a more sustainable uh, basis, then the precautionary demand for savings could come down and people would consume more and China would rebalance its economic growth. Uh, uh, Assistant Secretary Campbell alluded to this when he talked about the rebalancing agenda that's a, a key portion of the economic dimension of the bilateral relationship between China and um, the United States. So the first point I want to make and have made, I hope, is that the recovery program is not just government investment. There is a substantial role for private consumption. There's a substantial role for private investment. And there's also a substantial role for government uh, social uh, expenditures of the type that I've just been discussing. Now, <clears throat> a second criticism that you read about in the press all the time is that the government investment is heavily weighted towards a manufacturing, that China already has excess capacity, they're creating even more excess capacity, that they're going to go back to exporting their way uh, to high growth, uh, and that th this will be problematic in terms of China's trade relations with the rest of the world. It will also perhaps be deflationary in China. If you have a lot of excess capacity, then prices tend to fall. <coughs> it could become hard for companies to repay their loans uh, as their earnings decline. Well, China certainly does have excess capacity, but I don't think it's being uh, substantially exacerbated in China's stimulus program. The stimulus program is primarily monetary. That is the expansion of lending by uh, various banks, which are more or less controlled one way or another by the government, rather than through budgetary expenditures. And this is a diagram which looks at the composition of medium and long-term loans. In other words, any loan for a term of more than a year. These are the kinds of loans that are used to finance investment as opposed to shorter-term loans which finance working capital. And one of the key takeaways here is that uh, investment in manufacturing, the blue line, only accounts for about 10% of the expansion of credit by the banking system uh, in the first three quarters of this year. And it's really barely increased from previous years when it was running typically nine, eight and a half, nine, nine and a half percent. The lion's share of the investment of medium and long term, medium, the lion's share of the medium and long term lending by banks is going to infrastructure programs. This is massive expansions of uh, urban transportation systems, subway systems, water treatment systems, uh, high speed uh, inner city uh, trains uh, and so forth. And I think in general, I would argue that the return on these kinds of investments is likely to be fairly high. China is still a rapidly urbanizing society. The demand for infrastructure uh, is quite substantial. Another couple hundred million people are going to move into the cities over the next 10 years or so. The demand for the services that this infrastructure uh, supplies will be quite substantial. And I think the real economic return to these kinds of investment uh, will be uh, very high. If you listen to Barack Obama's speech today in Washington talking about more infrastructure expenditure coming uh, in the U.S., he made a similar kind of argument for the United States. I think it applies much more to China, where only half the people live in cities now, roughly, and uh, urbanization will uh, accelerate and, and continue to grow uh, 
uh, over uh, the next uh, couple of decades. So the, I'm, I'm basically skeptical of the view that China's massively misallocating resources, putting money into manufacturing. I would argue rather that investment in manufacturing this year has probably actually declined because most investment in China uh, in manufacturing is financed with retained earnings and particularly in the early part of the year when the economy was growing very slowly, companies' profits were lower than they had been in earlier periods. There's been some recovery uh, in the last couple of quarters, but profits are still much lower this year than they were uh, last year, particularly in the first half. So uh, the combination of reduced profits and uh, not a large share of lending suggests that manufacturing investment has not been a big driver of China's recovery. It's the substantial increase uh, in uh, loans that are going to uh, infrastructure investment of the type that I've just been uh, describing. The third critique that I want to uh, take up briefly is this argument that, um, that, again, you read it quite frequently, is that lending growth in China has been so massive, the increase in credit has been so large uh, that it has created excess liquidity, which eventually will lead to high inflation uh, and lots of dislocation as a result. And it is true that in the first half of this year, um, this, this shows us uh, the month-on-month month month increase in loans outstanding uh, uh, starting at the beginning of 2008. And you can see in 2008, typically loans are going up by 300, 400 billion RMB per month, but starting when the stimulus program was announced uh, in the fall of last year, we had many months uh, of over six, seven, eight hundred billion uh, RMB, and a couple of months uh, that were uh, well over, I guess, three months that were well over a trillion RMB. So there's been a massive increase in lending. But if you look at the diagram, you will see that this has begun to taper off. The last four months are much, much lower. So that although China's headline policy continues to be exactly the same, they had a Central Economic Work Conference in Beijing uh, that concluded, I think, on uh, Monday this week, and the headline policy is the same as it has been for a year, and they're describing it as moderately loose monetary policy. Uh, but underneath that, there have been some adjustments. Credit growth is beginning to s slow down to a more sustainable level. Uh, and if that continues, I think uh, China will avoid most of the inflation problems that people have anticipated. It is true China has a big problem. It has the same problem every other country in the world has today, and that is what you read about in the newspaper, especially if you look at the financial press every day. It's the so-called exit problem. When should the government start to withdraw the support that has led to the beginning of recoveries uh, in a lot of economies and hopefully will lead to recoveries even, even more. So, you know, in the U.S., it's the repaying of those funds that the various financial institutions borrowed and most, you know, how soon should the Fed start raising interest rates uh, above the extremely low levels that have prevailed now for more than a year. China has the same exit problem. And uh, I think it is uh, beginning uh, to deal with it, and the, the lending growth uh, has slowed down. Um, and if that continues as we move into uh, 2010, I think this problem uh, is, um, is going to be manageable, a challenge but manageable. So my conclusion is basically that China's stimulus program has been quite successful. We saw it in the first diagram. Growth has recovered relatively early compared to many other countries, relatively rapidly. And if you look in the details about uh, the charges that have been leveled against China's stimulus program, that it's all investment, um, that they're creating a lot of excess capacity in manufacturing, that credit growth is so rapid it's going to lead to an inflationary blowout. I, I, you can't eliminate some of those uh, possibilities, but I think in general these criticisms are uh, somewhat uh, exaggerated. Well, let me um, turn next to this question of, of the rebalancing challenge that uh, uh, Kurt Campbell mentioned uh, or re alluded to in the, the answer to one of the, one of the early questions that he took. Um, and this is really a very important issue because it is going to determine the success China has at this, I believe, will determine uh, 
whether their growth can continue at a very high rate of the type we've seen in the past, the 9 to 10 percent range, or whether their future growth will be uh, somewhat more modest. And this year is somewhat encouraging. The imbalances that have emerged in the Chinese economy over the last five or six years seem to be much, much smaller. For example, if you look at the external side, China uh, in the middle part of this decade became a massive surplus country, selling far more exports to the rest of the world uh, than it purchased in imports. So it had a huge trade surplus, indeed the largest trade surplus on record for any significant economy. As measured by the current account, which includes a few other items besides trade, China's surplus by 2007 was 11 percent of, of, of GDP. Um, those of you who may remember back uh, of, in the period when the United States was criticizing Japan back in the mid-1980s when they had a big trade surplus, led to a lot of trade friction with the United States. At its peak, Japan's current account surplus was 3.4 percent of GDP. So China's surplus relative to the size of its economy uh, was three times bigger than this uh, big Japanese surplus of a couple of decades ago. But the surplus is declining dramatically. Uh, this year, I, I expect the current account surplus will be about half of what it was in uh, 2007. Um, China's exports are down this year much more than its imports, uh, which uh, means that this external imbalance. In terms of the internal side, I th think I've already given you part of the answer. There's beginning to be a rebalancing of the economy on the internal side as well, because consumption is making a bigger contribution uh, to economic growth and it has in the past. This is the first year in the first three quarters of this year is the first time uh, that consumption growth has been more rapid than GDP growth. So consumption is playing a larger role in generating um, economic growth. The question really is whether or not these trends are sustainable over time. On the external side, uh, I believe it's likely that China's surplus will tend to grow as we move through 2010 for several reasons. First of all, we'll see more recovery in the United States and Europe. That will increase imports in those countries, which will mean an increase in China's exports. So we could get a reversal of the situation that we've seen so far this year when their exports are down much more than their imports. That's partly because China's recovered earlier and as their economy be begins to grow more rapidly or has begun to grow more rapidly compared to the rest of the world, their demand is rising and that sucks in imports. Uh, but demand in the United States and most other advanced industrial economies is still very anemic. So China's exports are down much more than their imports. That could reverse as we get more general global recovery. Uh, China also had a lot of commodity speculation in the first part of the year. Commodity prices were very depressed by uh, recent standards and a lot of Chinese trading companies uh, imported massive amounts of commodities, things like iron ore, copper and so forth. Those copper imports in the first seven months were something like 130 percent greater than they had been in the same period of 2008. So they built up big stockpiles and now those are beginning, uh, imports of commodities are beginning to taper off. So the, the internal, uh, excuse me, the external imbalance uh, might uh, get bigger next year. Internally, I think the big challenge for China is still to generate more rapid growth of personal income, of disposable income, of wages, if you will. And I think um, that is essential because you cannot, as we've seen from the lesson of the United States, you can't build uh, a, a aggregate, you know, you can't build consumption growth over the long term by, by borrowing more and more money. You know, we basically had a debt driven consumption boom in the United States, but it can't last because eventually debt levels uh, get too high as we saw in the US. Uh, China wants to avoid that, so they need to move towards a more consumption driven growth path, but a consumption driven growth that is based on the growth of income, not the growth of borrowing and debt. And uh, I think this is not likely to occur uh, until two things happen. First, their currency uh, needs to appreciate uh, significantly from where it is today. Uh, that's very important because the undervalued currency in China, if you're selling a dollar's worth of exports into the international market with an undervalued currency, you get back more domestic currency when you uh, convert back into RMB, and that means uh, 
activities that involve exports or competing with imports are more profitable than they would be uh, if the exchange rate was not undervalued. So essentially what an undervalued exchange rate does is it tilts investment into the manufacturing sector, and that's what's happened in China over the last five years. And how does that relate to this consumption rebalancing story? Well, it's very simple. The manufacturing sector, on average, is much more capital intensive than the services sector, and so as you tilt investment into manufacturing, you create fewer jobs and you have slower wage growth, and that combination is certain. Uh, that combination basically has uh, produced what we've seen in China over the last five to seven years, and which has been a decline in the wage share of GDP. So the first thing China needs to do is to have uh, some significant appreciation of its currency uh, so that services and manufacturing on a more level playing field, that would lead to more investment in, in services, more job creation, more growth of wages, and that would form the basis for more sustained growth uh, in consumption. A related uh, re reform that's needed is to uh, reform the prices of factor inputs. I've argued for years that China is a very market-driven economy in labor markets and product markets and so forth. But there are certain things the government still controls the price, and energy is probably the best example. Energy prices, whether you're talking about fuels like gasoline and diesel fuel or electricity, is significantly underpriced. The power generating companies get subsidized so that they can sell their output at, a, at a less than the cost of the fuels that go into generating uh, the electricity. And in China, most electricity is used in manufacturing. Households, you know, in the cities you see glitzy buildings that seem to, you know, they have air conditioning and all kinds of other things. But you get out to the countryside, most people are living in a house that has one light bulb, and maybe if they're very prosperous, they might have a TV or a refrigerator. But the result is that the vast majority of electricity in China is actually used in manufacturing rather than in households. It's a very different structure of demand than we see in the United States. Um, so when you have an underpriced uh, resource like electricity, it's a subsidy to the manufacturing sector, which again, like an undervalued currency, tends to increase the profit profitability in manufacturing, and in this respect, China is a market economy. If you distort prices like the exchange rate and inputs like energy, you will, I guarantee, what we've seen in the last five years is that investment goes into those sectors. Entrepreneurs, businesses expand, their, uh, expand manufacturing, um, and that, as I said, uh, leads to uh, lower wage growth and lower growth of employment. So internally, I think uh, there's still uh, more uh, reform is needed in terms of pricing, uh, both of foreign exchange and of certain key inputs like electricity and fuels. If China moves strongly in those directions, I think it has the potential to create, uh, get its investment internally reallocated more towards the service sector, generate more, more jobs, more growth of wages, which generates more disposable income, which can be the basis for uh, more consumption-driven growth, which is the rebalancing that uh, Secretary Campbell was uh, referring to in his remarks. So China's, I think, recovery is very strong. Uh, it's driven by a very, very, uh, I think, very, very well-designed stimulus program. It's not just investment. There's a consumption component. I didn't mention a lot of the consumption has been driven by reductions in taxes, for example, on automobiles, consumer durables. Uh, which has given, given people an extra incentive to go out and buy these things. They've been willing to take on more debt uh, uh, to do that. Uh, China has also been assisted, quite frankly, by the fact that its financial structure left it relatively unaffected by the global financial crisis. They don't need to deleverage. The households don't have much debt. The corporate sector does not have a lot of debt. The government itself does not have uh, a lot of debt compared to, say, for example, uh, the United States. So uh, the combination of a well-designed stimulus program and certain structural f features of their economy uh, have led to this relatively uh, strong recovery. So I think China can easily do the 8%, 8, 8 to 9% growth. But getting back up to the uh, 9, 10% range, uh, as they have had over the past decade or so, I think will require more 
domestic economic reform, and the reason is very straightforward. They cannot rely on the United States to continue to be the consumer of last resort because consumption growth in the United States, I think, is going to be, uh, obviously, compared to the recent past, will be somewhat anemic for a number of years. So they need to generate more domestic demand uh, from consumption rather than exports. If they can succeed at doing that, I think they'll continue on their relatively strong uh, growth path. If they don't, they'll grow, they'll have to grow, uh, they'll have to accept uh, a somewhat slower growth than they've seen over the past uh, three decades. Well, let me stop there and uh, take questions if you have them. Yeah, I wonder why do we continue to let China manipulate its currency for many, many years, which results in the United States products to China being up to 40 percent more costly, and their exports to us 40 percent cheaper. And this has gone, been gone on for uh, quite a few years. How much longer are we going to allow them to manipulate the currency? Well, um, the, here, the basic problem, quite frankly, is that we don't have very many policy instruments to get them to change their currency value. Um, we do not, you, you can't put on tariffs. Let's say, I've, I've already said, I agree with you, their currency is undervalued. Let's say it's by 10% or whatever number we think it is. We could offset that by a 10% tariff. That's what Nixon did back in 1971. He said all these, Japan and Europe, all these currencies are undervalued. And he said they need to be market determined and to float. And he put on 10% tariffs. And within a matter of months, all those countries allowed their currencies to float. That was possible in 1970 or 71 when he did it. It's not legal anymore because we constrained what uh, we would do and other countries have constrained what they will do in this organization called uh, the World Trade Organization. So we cannot just kind of unilaterally put on tariffs because we think somebody's currency is not uh, appropriate or is undervalued. So our ability to, uh, to get other countries to move their currencies is quite limited. We've seen it. Uh, over the years, in the case of Japan, we finally got them to move a little bit. Uh, China's currency has been undervalued, uh, and I think continues to be undervalued, even though their external surplus is getting smaller. But we, we send our Treasury secretaries over to talk about this issue, but we don't have very many concrete levers. Uh, and some members of Congress have tried to design bills that would give us more leverage and still be consistent with our international obligations. Uh, but that hasn't worked. So really the alternative is to you know, kind of resign from the WTO. You can decide you're not going to be a member anymore, and then you could do whatever you want on tariffs. But uh, that, that, you know, most people think that would be shooting ourselves in the foot, that we, we'd be giving up, there'd be, there'd be retaliation, and we'd be in a downward spiral in terms of global trade. So I think the reality is we don't, we don't have a lot of leverage. In my own, I've been writing about this for uh, the last five or six years, and I think the argument in the, at the end of the day that it will cause China to change its policy is an, a better understanding of these domestic factors that I think make a really compelling case for allowing their currency to appreciate. Uh, they, but they don't like to respond to international pressure. Uh, Joe Mel from the Detroit Chinese Business Association. I have a question for you regarding uh, inflation. You mentioned briefly China might be able to avoid inflation problems, which face uh, many countries who put down a lot of money. But uh, news broke out several weeks ago in China. There was a sudden price uh, increase, uh, garlic, pepper, cooking oil rice. So do you expect that price increase would uh, spread to other commodities or consumer products? Well, you're, you're, it is interesting. The garlic and certain products have shot up in price, and some people are uh, attributing this to the rapid growth of the money supply and so forth. I think what we're going to see in China, as you know, uh, China's leadership historically has been, uh, you know, in the entire period since 1949, has been very sensitive to inflation. And whenever inflation starts uh, rising, uh, we see very substantial reaction on the part of the government, tightening up monetary policy, raising interest rates, and so forth. Now, they are somewhat constrained because with their currency undervalued and probably eventually going to appreciate, if they raise their interest rates too high, 
then they will attract some capital inflow, which makes it harder for them to keep their currency undervalued. So there is a, there is a bit of a trade-off. But I think China has a lot of headroom. Uh, they reduced reserve requirements uh, quite a few times in, uh, in 2007 and early 2008 as part of their monetary tightening. They could reverse those steps without having a big effect on the interest rate. So I think they will be very, very, very vigilant on inflation. I think the consumer price index will be back into positive territory before the end of the year, but I don't think it's going to go above, you know, three or possibly four percentage points as we move through uh, next year. A while ago, almost one and a half years ago, uh, around two, uh, 2007, Chinese government temporarily allowed the currency appreciate little, which caused over 10,000 business going bankrupt around the uh, Zhujiang Chi Chi um, Delta area. So I guess my question is, how can you persuade the Chinese government, hey, if you allow RMB to appreciate, which won't cause a lot of factories going bankrupt. Thank you. Well, I think this is the classic political problem. You have to accept some short-term pain in order to get long-term gain. Once you have a big manufacturing establishment because you have distorted prices that make manufacturing more profitable, then if you want to rebalance in order to get more growth in the services sector, inevitably some of those manufacturing firms will turn out not, will no longer be profitable and they will, or they'll lose employment and some of them will shut down. And I'm, I can make a kind of theoretical argument that the new jobs you're going to create in services sector will be many times more than you're going to lose uh, from, the, from closing down uh, or the bankruptcy of some of the manufacturing establishments. But, you know, politicians don't like to accept short-term gains, a short-term pain for long-term gain. I think it's the same problem uh, in China. Uh, the argument that the Chinese make for the so-called stability of their currency uh, is basically one of employment. But I think, it's, I think the argument is very, very short-term in nature. The growth of employment in China has slowed dramatically in this decade compared to the 1990s. In the 1990s, China did not have an undervalued currency. The service sector was expanding as a share of GDP. The growth of wages was much more robust. And disposable income as a share of GDP was, was more stable and uh, going, going down only slightly. In this decade, it's been falling like a rock. So I think the long-term evidence is quite clear. If you under, if you overinvest in manufacturing and under, underinvest in services, you're going to get slower job creation and slower growth of wages, and the consumption share of GDP is going to go down. But the problem is, once you've had five, six, seven years of overinvestment in manufacturing, you are going to have to accept some short-term pain to get on to the more sustainable, more productive growth path. So that does make it extremely difficult. You know, especially if you're a Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao, you've got two or three years left on your term why are you going to undertake some structural change that is going to be costly in the short run? They're going to try to postpone it. Do you think that China's increasing recognition of the dangers of climate change will lead them to increase the price of energy and fossil fuels in their economy? Do I think the Chinese are... That they're becoming more aware of global climate change. Oh, yes. Global okay. warming. Okay. Well, I think... Uh, I, I think there's really been a sea change in Chinese attitudes on global warming. Uh, they've studied the problem very intensively. They now understand uh, the scientific evidence of uh, supporting the idea of global war warming. And they've also done some fairly thorough research on exactly how it would affect China. You know, if the sea rises, you know, how, how much of coastal China is going to be underwater, what percentage of, of their GDP is going to be erased, uh, what percentage of the population they'll have to resettle. And that's why, in the current five-year plan, they adopted this target of reducing energy intensity. Uh, this is not a target to reduce the amount of energy used absolutely, but to reduce the amount of energy used per unit of GDP. Uh, and the goal was 20%, and I think they're going to, the last year of the five-year plan is next year. I think they're going to come close, maybe not quite. Uh, they'll probably get 17 18% at least reduction in energy intensity in the five-year plan. And Hu Jintao announced, uh, I guess now about two weeks ago or 10 days ago, that by 2020, they would reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions 
between 40 and 45 percent per unit of GDP. So that's a continuation of the same energy intensity approach, um, but it's now been expanded, it's now been converted basically into greenhouse gas emissions rather than just pure energy. Uh, and I think it's a fairly uh, aggressive target. Some people have dismissed it saying, well, they did, they did 20 percent uh, in the last five years, why can't they do you know, more than 20 percent in each of the next two five-year periods? But you know, I think they've already taken out a lot of the, what we would call the low-hanging fruit, and it will be increasingly difficult and challenging uh, for them to meet these, uh, this new goal. Uh, they have very aggressive targets on uh, the, the expansion of renewables, um, uh, certainly the most aggressive of any country in the world in terms of what they're, what they're hoping to achieve in terms of wind and solar uh, power generation. So, and I think there's a big push on uh, green technology in general, and I think China, there's a chance China will end up being uh, a major <coughs> player, if not the major player in this, in this space. On the consumption, the recent consumption increase, uh, the reason for that, for what you said, is the stimulus, right? Debt finance, sort of cheaper credit, more household borrowing, and also tax reductions on cars and things like that. But structurally, your argument is that they're still in an underconsumption because of the overinvestment in manufacturing. Isn't it true that a big chunk of the high savings, which is the other side of the story um, of, of low consumption in China, occurs in the corporate sector? Right. What, other than the undervalued currency, what are the reasons why there's such a high savings rate uh, in the corporate sector? And isn't one way to get rid of that to raise wages? Uh, which, of course, there's no necessary incentive to do so, except insofar as part of the corporate sector is state-owned and could actually do that. And if you did that, you would increase consumption, et cetera, right. and reduce exports, et cetera. Well, um, this is, I agree with, with uh, the, the information that you cited. It is true that a very large share of the increase in savings that has occurred in China uh, over this, this decade is because of an increase in corporate savings. But again, most of that has been generated in the manufacturing sector. Profits in manufacturing uh, back in 2002, 2003 were about 5% of GDP. Uh, by 2007, they were about 12% of GDP. So we've had a massive increase. Corporate profits is roughly equal to retained earnings, which is roughly equal to corporate savings. Um, now, the question is, what do, you, what do you do about this? Well, I've already suggested one thing you do is to have a more reasonable exchange rate because you artificially have boosted up profits in that sector through having an undervalued uh, currency. So the first policy tool would be, uh, you know, quit intervening in the foreign exchange market and building up these massive foreign exchange reserves which keep the currency undervalued. Uh, you say one other possibility would be to raise wages, but again, I go back to what I said before. China is basically a market economy uh, particularly in labor markets. I think the wages in China are pretty much determined by a labor market, and the government can't just dictate uh, higher wages. Uh, this leave, there are, however, a couple of other possibilities. One is <coughs> dividends. These corporates, uh, many, some of them are listed, many of them are not. The ones that are listed should pay higher dividends to their shareholders. They tried to implement this kind of a reform over the last three or four years, and so far, it has failed. The amount of money that's being collected in the dividend tax is trivially uh, small. But eventually, I think uh, one solution is to list more of the companies and have the, have the companies pay more dividends to shareholders. Because one of the reasons that um, household disposable income has gone down, it's not just that wages have not gone up fast enough, but also what is referred to as property income, which in China means basically dividends and interest income, have declined dramatically over this decade. Even though people save a lot more, they have a lot more money in the bank, but the real interest rate has gone down. Uh, and the amount of money that, that shareholders get from dividend payments uh, because they own some shares of companies listed on the Shanghai Stock Exchange is very low. Uh, so eventually uh, reforms in those areas could lead to uh, more growth of disposable income, higher, higher dividends, uh, 
that's another thing China needs to do is financial liberalization so that households are not implicitly taxed uh, by the very low rate of return that they get on their uh, savings and bank deposits. But I don't think raising wages is, is, is really uh, feasible given the market-oriented uh, labor markets that they now have. <clears throat> 